Good evening, everyone. We continue our study in the book of 2 Samuel, and we're at chapter 7, and we left off yesterday in verse 11. Just a quick recap, because it continues down to the rest of this chapter, uh, just to highlight to all of us that this statement, the Lord also declares to you that the Lord will make a house for you. Remember, this word is bait. And it means tent. It means house. It means home. And it means a dynasty. Now, a dynasty, just to for clarification, this is a royal lineage. Because David is king, so we're talking about his home, his, his future generations. And that is what God is promising him. Because this word will is something uh, that has not yet happened. And the Lord declares, made a decree, and this is going to stand. And so God is making a decree to David that he never made to Saul. So this is something which we have be, to be very careful and very clear. And again, I have highlighted that this whole chapter is a play on this word, by uh, the house or the home or the dynasty. In chapter 7, verse 1, it talks about an actual house that David was living in. There was a house of cedar built by Hiram, the king of Tyre. We read that in 2 Samuel chapter 5, verse 11. Right here in chapter 7, verse 11, then we are given to understand that God is using exactly the same word, that God is going to make a house, a bite for you. But God is not making a house of cedar. David already had one. And so by context, we see that this is about David's dynasty, which means that the son will become king and the next will become king. And that kind of an idea. And that was supposed to be what's going to happen to uh, Saul. But in 1 Samuel chapter 13, verses 13 and then 14, God says, no, I don't want you anymore. Now, God would have, but God would not now. And so without even saying it, uh, God would have retracted that intention. But in verse 11, God made his intention very clear. In verse 12 is where it is the promise of God or what some would call it a covenant. Uh, although it's not seen as a breach uh, or a covenant, this is really a, a promise of God. He says, when your days are finished, uh, when your days are satisfied, right? When your days are full, we can think of it as a full term, which means that the life of Every person has a, 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 a length that is naturally there. And God says, when your days, and this is about David, comes to an end, it comes to a full, comes to a full term, basically. And then it says, you will lie down with your fathers. Now, this word lie down is a very interesting Hebrew word. The word lie down is shakaf. And, and it's lie down, literally lie down. But depending on the context, it could be lying down uh, as symbolizing death. It could be lying down symbolizing sleep. It could be lying down symbolizing Sex. Now, these are some of the uh, expressions uh, to understand that this is a, a very important word. And most Hebrew words are quite dependent on the context that it is used. And in this case, we know for a fact 
that God is referring to the time when he lie down with your fathers, the fathers of David. And so this is a way of saying, oh, when the time comes and you die. Now notice this is an A and a B. Days are finished is a time where you lie down with your fathers. That's how it is used. So these are all very interesting phrases, but they actually mean the same thing. And so God says, I will raise up. Now this word raise up is to cause, cause to rise up. Now cause to rise up is actually a very, um, very vivid picture, uh, cause to stand up. And this would mean uh, to, to come to power. So when you have a king's uh, a son who would stand up among, so you can imagine the picture, everybody is seated down and somebody stands up. And so God says, I will do that. I am going to be the one that will cause your seed, the word descendant here is seed, right? Now, interestingly, in the, in the Hebrew, the word seed is, it's like the, the English word sheep. Uh, sheep can be singular, it can be plural, depending on the context. Uh, the word seed in Hebrew, uh, always appears in the singular, but it could mean singular or plural depending on the context. So the seed, your descendant after you or your seed that comes behind you. Now you might be wondering what is behind. English says it's after, but, but Hebrew is behind. The word behind is a very peculiar expression because this is a Hebrew expression. If a person is going this direction, so behind is here. All right? And so in terms of time, what you can see is the past. What is behind you? is the future. So when it says after you or behind you, means that he would be the one that is in the future, that will come after you in terms of uh, time, right? In terms of time. Because in Hebrew, they, they don't deal with time very much. So they deal with directions. And the directions is the one that in modern day, we would try to see it from our modern view as past and future. So this would be a seed that will come after David, that is behind David, but it will come from you. Now this word here is not well translated, unfortunately, that will come from you. It means that will go out from your loins. Remember, Hebrew is a very imagery-driven language. English would try to, to hide all the details, but Hebrew loves to talk about the details because you would be imagining what it is. So come out from you literally means go out from your loins. It would be his literal seed. And God says, I will establish his kingdom. The word establish means uh, to cause, cause to be firm. Means that nobody is there going to be shaking him out. It will be secure, right? Cause to be firm, cause to be secure. And God will do that. So I will establish his throne. That's basically what it says in verse 12. Now, this is commonly understood as the Davidic covenant that God has promised 
David, that he will have his seed that will remain on the throne. And that, that's basically the promise of God. But God continues to say in verse 13, And he shall build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. So again, establish. The word establisher in verse 13 uh, is also be firm, right? Stable. Now let's look at context. He. Who is this he? It would be this descendant. Is the he. The descendant, the seed after David who will come from his loins, as we see here. And God says, he, this one, that is his seed that God is going to use to build a house. And this is the same word, bite. And this word here would now mean literally the structure. And we understand this to be the temple. And there God will appoint it, and there God will give his name. Now, as of today, in this time, in verse 13 in chapter 7, you realize that God has not really pointed to David exactly where to put the ark. But David just placed the ark in the city of David. That's what we have talked about in chapter 6. Now, at the end of 2 Samuel is when God specifically points to a place. And so this one here, for my name, would be a memorial to remember God. And so this house is the same. So we have seen the play of words here with bite. And so we understand the word bite from the context. And then the throne of his kingdom, this would be a royal throne. Now understand that this word throne, um, throne is just a seat or, or in modern day, a chair. But in the context, we're talking about the chair of his kingdom. So it would be a royal throne. Now that would be the way that it's understood. But in its normal terminology, it literally means a seat, a chair, what you're sitting on. Uh, that, that would be exactly what the word is. So in Hebrew, it's quite interesting. The, the expanded meanings is really dependent on the context of the statement. Now, let me then point out one last word here, which is this word forever. This word forever is something we have talked about. Uh, that's olam. Olam means literally in a picture form beyond the horizon. So in the old days, when a person looks at the horizon, it's far away in terms of distance. It's going to take a long time in terms of time. right? And as you keep walking towards the horizon, it's always there. So it's going to take a, a while. So because of that, the English use the word forever. Uh, literally to represent the idea of a long, long time. Meaning the royal throne of the kingdom of the seed of David is going to be for a long time. And that's the idea of beyond the horizon. And what is behind the horizon is a secret. And when you can see the expanse of the horizon, it would represent the world at large. And so olam also means the world. Olam also means secret, because from that word, we get the word secret. Uh, olam means very far, 
very long time. So understand this. The throne of the, the, the kingdom of the seed of David, it does not mean forever and ever and doesn't stop. It means that it will be established for a long time. That, that's basically it. Now, how long is long? We don't know. The, the, the text merely says a long time. So, so that's how we understand this as the so-called Davidic covenant. This is the promise of God to David. In verse 14, it says this, I, notice I here is God, Jehovah. I will be to him a father. And so the relationship here is one of a father to a son. That's the idea that God is relating to him. Who is him? Him would be the seed of David. And the seed of David, it could be singular, it could be plural. And so we could be talking about just that one son that is going to build the house for God. Or here we can also talk about uh, all the sons that will come along as a representative or a representation from that one son. So he will be a son to me. These will, this will be actually the kind of a relationship of a father to a son. Now, I would like us to be very mindful that this kind of a relationship of a father and son is a Hebrew concept, which is very similar to the Chinese concept, but it's very different from the modern Western concept. So do not associate the relationship where God says, I will be a father to him and he will be a son to me as one of a modern day concept, it has to be seen as one of an ancient Hebrew concept. What does a father in the ancient days do? Now, if you have a conservative father, you would know what I mean. The conservative father says this, if he does wrong, and by doing wrong means um, if, Let's see. You know, let me just give you this word here. If he does wrong, uh, he if he he if he does uh, if he becomes perverse, if he is twisted, if he's crooked, that would be all the words that we could use. If he is troublesome, if he's trouble, if he's wicked. These are all the English words that we can use. If he is, uh, he commits iniquity, right? These are all good words. He does wrong. If, although the word wrong is not wrong, but it has a very broad meaning, right? It's got a very broad meaning. And so God says, if he does all this, I, God himself will discipline him with a rod of men and with strokes of the sons of Adam. Okay, so let me just explain this a little bit. So we, we need, now need to understand, I will discipline. The ancient father always disciplines the son whenever he does wrong. When he does good, it means that the son is just doing what is normal, all right? Good equals normal. Uh, bad or evil equals discipline. Now, in our modern day concept, we may have a very different idea of discipline. And so God says, I will discipline him. I will reprove him. I will judge him. I will uh, correct him because he has done wrong. I will correct him. But the correction here is not the modern way of correction that 
I will sit him down and I will counsel him. I will talk to him uh, very gently. There, there's no such Western psychological or child psychology implemented here. In ancient times, when the father sees the son doing wrong, out comes the pain. And there will be physical punishment. I think even in the West, in the old days, the father would take out the belt and will give that kind of a discipline to the child. Uh, well, I guess modern day has changed that quite a lot. And so God says, I will chastise him with a rod of men, which means that this is a cane. The rotan of men, and then this will be an A, and this will be a B. The second one here is with the strokes that you will strike. To strike, to wound. Right? Strike to wound and to inflict. So that you know that the rod and the stroke, they are, they're talking about the same thing. I will use the cane of men and to strike to wound by the sons of Adam. Now, one of the things that we need to understand is this. Whenever we talk about men here, generally we're talking about the, um, the idea of uh, men or mortal men, right? Mortal men. Uh, mankind is Adam. So the idea here is the, the punishment is going to come generally from people on the outside. And later we'll see the Syrians, uh, the Babylonians. Uh, then we have other nations that God used to discipline them. All right. Continuing in verse 15, it says, but my favor, understand this, my favor means hesed. Hesed is kindness. God's kindness shall not depart. The word depart is not go away, but shall not turn aside. What does turn aside actually mean? Now, turn aside means if you are on the road, turn aside means I will go away from the road. That's, that's what turn aside means. And if the kindness of God is turned aside, then it means that the person will not experience the loyalty or the kindness of God. And so God says, I am going to make you a promise that my kindness will not be turned away from him. Again, the seed of David. And we get an equivalent of what actually happened as I took away from Saul, whom I removed from you. So let's break this down a little bit. God actually um, took away from Saul. Unfortunately, this is, this, is the bad, this is the way that I can demonstrate to you that this is what English does. The word took away is exactly the same word that is turned aside. Exactly the same Hebrew word. But in English, you know that your English teacher will tell you you should never use the same word twice in the same sentence. And so the translator used that style. So they, he would say that, God's kindness would not depart from him as I took it away from Saul. It should be said that in Hebrew, it reads, my favor shall not turn aside from him as I cause it to turn aside from Saul. It is the same word. Right? It's the same word. And then finally, as I removed would you believe it that this word is also turned aside from your face? So in one sentence here, we find the word depart, 
took away, remove. It's exactly the same word in the Hebrew. And the Hebrew keeps using the same word so that we know that this is what God meant, that God didn't mean something else. Now, oftentimes I've mentioned to you that God says what he means and means what he says. And by that, you now can see in verse 15 a very literal meaning that God says he will not turn aside his kindness. He actually means that. It's not about departing, take away, remove, although they are all part of the thesaurus of synonyms, but God doesn't play with synonyms. God here really uses the same word so that we are not mistaken how the kindness of God was turned aside from Saul. And so it's important for us then to realize God says, I don't want you anymore, and God turned away. And that's it. And when the kindness of God turns away, you find that God will not even listen to Saul. And God turns Saul away from David, essentially to show David that God is not with Saul, but God will be with David. So that is what it means by the God's kindness. It is God's character, God's presence. It's, it's given to or shown to David but no longer shown to Saul. And so verse 15 is an incredible promise that this whole idea of him, that the, 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 the descendants, the seed that will come after David, will enjoy significant uh, presence of God or togetherness with God or the company of God or the, the how would you say, the, the partnership with God differently from how Saul had enjoyed that. Now that that's, that's really what verse 15 actually means. Now coming to a close of his promise, in verse 16, then we see, your house and your kingdom shall endure before me forever, and your throne shall be established forever. Now immediately you see here we have an A, and a B, right? An A and a B. So let's break this down a little bit. We spend a little bit of time here. It's okay because this is a very key passage. Your house, your bite. The house that God is going to build for David, that is his legacy, his royal lineage, and your kingdom the sphere of rain, right? The throne. That's what your kingdom is. The kingdom is represented by the power that is extended from the seat of the palace where he sits. It says here, it shall endure. This word here, uh, endure means it is going to be upheld. It is going to be, how should we say, um, made firm. It is going to be established. Basically, it says that it's going to be there, right? It's going to be there. That's what it means, endure. It's going to be there. It's got nothing to do with enduring persecution or enduring uh, oppression. This word endure means it's going to continue. It's going to be made firm. It's going to be established. And it says it's going to be there uh, to my face. Again, the word forever. Olam, for a long time. Then your throne, your seat shall be established. Now, this word is uh, firmly fixed, right? Firmly fixed, which uh, also means secure. Similar understanding of this word endure, established. And again, we see this word olam, forever. So understand that 
the house or the legacy of David and his fear of rain will continue before God for a long time. His throne, the seat that he is going to reign from, shall be very secure for a long time. Now, that's what verse 16 literally means. So I hope that we understand the promise of God to David that is actually not specifically only David, but more so to the sons of David or the seed of David that comes thereafter. There'll be one seed that comes directly from his loins that will build the house for God. And the rest of them who will come thereafter will enjoy the promise of God to David. And so Nathan spoke to David all these words exactly. And so we see here in verse 17, it says, in accordance. Uh, basically, it means he spoke all these words and all this vision. So here we now understand that the words were spoken, and this is an A and a B, in a vision. So God spoke and God spoke via a vision. And that would be how we would understand uh, when Nathan was talking to God or, or engaged with God in the evening, in the night, just like Daniel. And so this was exactly what happened. And so we get clues across the chapter. Now, very quickly, let us go on to verse 18. Now, verse 18 is a response by King David. It keeps saying, David the king, uh, or the king David. Uh, that, that's how the Hebrew word used, is used, right? He came in and sat before the Lord. Now, remember what we said uh, in chapter 6, when he danced before the Lord, in this case, he sat before the Lord. It means that he was in front of the ark of God. The ark of God represents the presence of God. It represents who God is. And there's a throne above the cherubim. And so he sits there and he says, essentially, he, 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 he treats himself as if he's talking to God. And so by and large, uh, this is seen, uh, I guess, to many people uh, describing this as a prayer of David. Okay, we can call this a prayer in the sense that he is addressing God, saying these words. And so let us look at what he said. He said this, who am I, Lord? Right? Who am I, Lord God? Now, again, this is a very peculiar translation. And I think we need to sort, sort this out. Um, the word Lord God and the word Lord here is Adonai and the word God here is Yehovah. So in actual fact, in the Hebrew, it says, who am I? Adonai Yehovah. Now, when you translate it as Lord God, uh, it is the choice of the translator. And so, in NASB, uh, they, they use this capital G, capital O, capital D. Now, in NIV, I think you find it as a sovereign Lord. Now, the word sovereign doesn't appear. It's inserted by the translator. It literally means Adonai Yehovah, uh, Lord, or Adonai, my Lord, Yehovah. Who am I addressing specifically to God? Who am I and who is actually my house? Now, this word household is bait. God says, I'm going to build you a bait. So, who am I and who is my bait? 
that you have brought me this far. So this is an acknowledgement. David acknowledges God's provision. He realizes that who God is, he is Elohim, he is Adonai Yehovah, he is the most high El Elyon. And then he looks at himself and says, who am I? I'm, I'm nobody, I'm just your creature, I'm your servant. That is the, the expression, who am I? Right? That you have brought me this far, you have protected me, you have anointed me, you have made me king, you've let me reign in Hebron, uh, you, you've allowed me to conquer and take over Jerusalem, and so on and so forth. And that's what he is reflecting on right now. In verse 19, he says, As though this was yet a small thing in your eyes. This is seen, insignificant means small. Right? Small. Uh, a small matter. And so David is saying, you know, all these things that you've said, it appears that it is just a, it's a simple thing in your eyes. Now, it's important whenever you see this. In the English, for some reason, at this point in time, it was not translated, but left as eyes, right? Otherwise, it's always before you. But in your eyes is very important. And this is Adonai Yehovah. In your eyes, we will see uh, grace. We will see good. We will see evil, right? This is uh, Chen. This is Tov. This is Ra or Ra'a. Uh, and so on and so forth. Because in the, in the ancient Hebrew or ancient Oriental, even in Chinese thinking, you find that what the person sees is important. And so David saying, well, this looks like it's a small thing in your eyes. And for you have spoken of the house of your servant. That's David. And so he's saying, who am I? I'm your, only a servant regarding uh, the distant future. Now, the word distant future is the word... Uh, from remote uh, or in a distance, right? Or in a far away time or place. And so distant future would be from afar. You're talking to me of things that is going to be, well, no, down the road. And this is the custom of mankind, Adonai Yehovah. Now, what is the custom here? This is the manner of mankind. Now, this is the custom of how life is. This is, how should we say, this is called the, the Torah of Mankind, the custom of mankind, the culture of mankind, or the Torah of mankind, the practices of mankind, the directions of mankind, what they would want to talk about as they go on down the road. If David is king, he would hope that his children will be king and his children's children will be king. So that's how mankind talks about. And, and Adonai Yehovah, you are saying, this to me, and, and you're not only saying next generation, but the generation after next. Again, what more can David say to you? And basically, we're saying David is speechless. That Adonai Yehovah is making such promises and decrees to David, who he considers himself very small. Uh, he considers himself as the little flock of God, like in Psalm 23, 
right? The Lord is my shepherd. The Lord is the one who is shepherding me. Uh, the Lord is the shepherd. I'm the, the flock. I'm the goat or I'm the sheep of the, the, in, the, in his pastures. And he says, for you know your servant, Adonai Yehovah. For you know. The word know uh, is from the word yada. And the word know is an important word. It literally means you, you actually perceive me. You understand me. Right? Uh, what else? You can see me. You know me by experience. From a shepherd boy till now, you know me when I was born. Uh, you have watched me grow. You've seen what I've gone through. So this is what it means. You know your servant. This is not talking about knowing David. In the future. That is why God is promising David that no matter what happens, this is what I will do for your generations to come. This is what it means that I will build you a house. That is what everything that was written from verse 12 onwards actually means. In verse 21, uh, uh, sorry, in verse 20, it is a description of how David understands God. So you, you need to see the relationship between David and God one who really fears God, treats God as awesome, treats God as one to be feared, one to be listened to, and he knows that he does not deserve things from the great God. In verse 21, it says, For the sake of your word, for the, the, well, the word, for the sake of your word, for, for the, Purpose, for the purpose of your word, uh, for the sake of your word, and according to your heart. Does God have a heart? Well, it is to explain to us that this is the mind of God, right? This is lev, is mind, for the sake of your word, A and B. Your word and mind is equal. The word of God is seen to be something equivalent to the decisions of God, the will of God. And because of that, it says, you have done all this greatness. You have brought about all these great things to let your servant know, to, so that I, now that he can understand how great is God? That, that's really a very important lesson. And, and David is resonating and responding to the promises that was made that Nathan had told David. Verse 22. It says, for this reason, this reason is everything God has done Everything God has said, right? Or you can say everything God has decreed, promised, whatever the English word you want to use. It says, for this reason, he's not just saying it because God had said that I will build you a house. God expanded on what he meant by I will build you a house. And for this reason that when you say you build me a house with all these details, you are great. Adonai Yehovah. You are great. You are great means you are powerful. You are powerful. 
you can do what you say in the future. That's why Adonai Jehovah is his Elohim. And in his response, there is no one like you. There is none like you. There is none that resemble you. All right? Resemble you. So it means that God is very unique. And it says there is no God, and this word here is Elohim, Mighty One. And this word, except you, uh, except you means besides you. Besides you. What does that mean? So now we have an also here. This is an A and a B. There is no one that resembles you. There is no Elohim beside you. So if Adonai Yehovah, right? Adonai Yehovah. has no one that resembles him and that there is no Elohim besides Adonai Yehovah. That is what it means by unique. You are one and only. Right? You are one and only. That is what it means by unique. One and only. And it says here, according to all that we have heard with our ears. According to all we have heard with our ears is a very interesting expression. It means that over time that the, the works right, of God is told. Everything that is said until today, whatever we have heard, that it 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 is clear, it has evidence that God, you are one and only. And that is what it means, no one like you, there's none like you, there's no God besides you or no God except you or no Elohim besides you. Both statements essentially says that you are one and only. You are a powerful God because you can do what you say and what you said in the past, you have done it now and what you're going to say now, you will do in the future. That is what it means that God is powerful. God is great. And so let us not just sing songs that says God is great without having a comprehension as to what that may mean. And I trust that today when we look at chapter 7, verse 22, we, we, we come to realization. Verse 23, as what one nation on the earth. Now, this is what I... I I'm not quite happy with the translation. What one nation, uh, not on the earth, but you would say that in the, um, how should we say, on the whole world? The whole world as in the physical world uh, would be a good way of expressing it. So, Earth, not the third rock from the sun, but as described by people. One nation, and the word nation here really isn't specifically nation. One people in the whole world of people. That's what it means. Nothing is like your people, Israel. Why is that so? Because God went to redeem for himself as a people, to make a name for himself, so that through Israel, people will know God, and to do a great thing for you, and awesome things for your land, because of your people whom you have redeemed for yourself, from Egypt, nations, 
and their God. So what does this mean? Egypt is one as a land, nation, and their gods is three. So the whole idea is the word redeem, ga'al, is to bring back to original ownership. And so that they are no longer slaves in Israel, uh, in Egypt, they will become a people of God, a nation of God. And so God went to redeem them as a people, as his people, as his nation, uh, a group of people to make a name for himself so that the world will know who God is and they are to do a great thing and that as they progress and live, the world will know who God is and whatever they are going to do uh, in terms of awesome things, great things for your land, right? For your land. And I just want to point out about this, your land. We have always said the promised land, the promised land, it is the land of Israel, the land that belongs to Israel, but it really belongs to God, ultimately, because God has the right to do what he wants to the people who is occupying this land. And so later, when we have time, we'll deal with this. Uh, let us continue to finish this chapter. For you have established for yourself your people. It's always your people because... David is the king of God's people, is your own people forever. What is forever? Olam, for a long time, right? And you, Lord Jehovah, has become their Elohim. This is what it means that God has done all these things and and now God wants to make sure that it continues under David. Verse 25. Now then, Adonai Yehovah, the word that you have spoken about your servant and his house. All right? He says, Confirm it. Confirm it means cause it to stand. Basically, make it happen. It hasn't happened yet. And says, make it happen forever. Olam, continue to let it be. Do just as you have spoken. All right. So what God has spoken is, is his promise. It is the word that God has said. And so, David is very happy with it. And David is telling God, is this great, please make it happen. In verse 26, so that the reason that you make it great is because it's your people. And I, my house is going to rule over your people. And the purpose of that is so that your name may be great. Olam. You see, through his people, through God's people, that David is to rule and his seed is to rule, is so that God's name will be lifted up. Verse 26, it says, it will be great. Uh, it will be strong. Right? It will be strong. It will be mighty. And then it also says, the Lord of armies is God over Israel. Yehovah Zavaot is Elohim al Israel, God over Israel. This is really to say God is over Israel. And David is the head. And so make this happen so that the house of your servant David be established before you. Verse 27, for you, Yehovah Tzavaot, and it says, this is Elohei Israel, the God of Israel, 
have given a revelation to your servant. Now, this word revelation, something that is uncovered. Right? That's what it means to reveal, something that is revealed to your servant. And so the revelation that God has made to David is, I will build you a bite. And therefore, your servant has found courage to pray this prayer to you. So your servant has found courage to pray this prayer. And the word courage here um, means heart. Uh, it means heart. Although it's a new word. So you can see this is one of the rare words, rare English words is using for the word heart. Has found the heart, has found the will to pray. Right? Uh, and it's about palal, right? this prayer to you. It is speaking to God. And it's an awesome prayer. If we study this in more detail, you realize how close David is with God. And the way he prays to God is not God give me 100 things in a laundry list, but thanking God for what God has promised to do for him. Verse 28. Now then, Adonai Yehovah, uh, you are Elohim. And your words are truth. Your words is trustworthy. What does that mean? Your words will always be true. And you have promised this good thing to your servant. And so your words is trustworthy means God is faithful. What he says he will do. And that you have promised. The word promised is spoken. And so you have an A and a B. The words of God that is trustworthy is what is spoken that it is good to your servant. Good in the eyes of David because God's word can be depended upon. And finally, in verse 29, as we come to a close, it says, and now, and now, um, may it please you to bless the house of your servant. Again, by it. And now, if it pleases you, uh, so that of your servant David to bless, bless by God, although it is to say good things. When God says good things, God will do it. When man says good things, it is a wish, right? So understand that in the Hebrew context, if it pleases you to bless the bias of your servant, which he, God, Jehovah, is going to build so that it may continue forever before you. The word continue forever is olam. Be olam. For a long time. For you, Adonai Jehovah, have spoken. So it is true. It will happen. With your blessings, may the house of your servant be blessed forever. So this is the prayer of David uh, looking at God that when God blessed to say a good thing, to do it forever, I think we also need to understand that God will never bless when the sons of David were no good. God only blessed them when the sons of David were good. And so the blessings of God continues to be with the house of David on condition 
that the sons of David is like David, to know God, to fear God, to know that God is God and David is man, and to walk before God in a humble way. And so this prayer is not a one-sided prayer. This prayer is contingent upon the descendants, the seed of David to be like David and to continue to be blessed by God. And with this, we come to the end of chapter 7. Does the word phrase lie down with your fathers give the idea that David will join his ancestors in the afterworld? It, it does give that connotation because in the Hebrew Bible, in the Old Testament context, they don't talk about heaven and hell. They talk about going to the afterworld and it's called Sheol. And so in the afterworld is what they can see because they are putting them into the hole uh, called uh, Sheol and going to a place wherever that may be. And so they don't discuss things that they don't see and don't know. Uh, so it is very much that kind of an action and concept. Yeah? Uh, can we consider the seed to be Solomon? Right now in chapter 7, we don't know who that is because Solomon hasn't come into the scene yet. All God promised is that it must come from his loins, the seed that comes from his loins, which means that there will be continuity. Not like Saul, his son will never be king, but for David, his son will be. That's what it means by the seed that will come from your loins. Verse 15 doesn't mean my love. Verse 15 means my kindness. Uh, God will be kind to them. Even they disobey God, that is true. And when they do disobey God, then God will discipline and judge them by the came the rotan of men and the strokes of the sons of Adam. And so God will chastise them like a father and a son. So that relationship was not given to Saul, as you can see. Verse 19, distant future is not olam. Verse 29, yes, it's olam. Yes, it's, it's olam. So you find that this word here, continue forever, is about olam. And uh, the blessings be blessed forever, also olam. It is uh, for a long, long time. David see, does it mean his sons by all his wives? Uh, that is correct. Actually, the frame is not about the wives. The frame is about the seed that will come from David's loins, whoever the women may be. That, that is the expression. All right, I'm sorry we have ran over time. Uh, I'll see you on Monday for the next chapter. Bye-bye.